All right, let's get it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. All right, in the bullpen today, we have Mr. Eric Peterson, associate contributor, Young Voices, tech policy analyst and commentator, various outlets, very, very smart guy, policy expert. We're going to talk about Elon Musk purchasing, threatening to purchase through what's called a hostile takeover, Twitter. Eric, thank you for being on the show. How are you? I'm good, happy to be on. It's been a big day for all things bird related app. That's right. All right, this is gonna be interesting, Eric. So I don't want to presume what you know or believe about Elon Musk and the purchase of Twitter, potential purchase of Twitter. So if you would give us your sentiment and I would then opine. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really interesting for sure, right? I mean, this all started a few weeks ago where he put out a Twitter poll asking people if you thought that Twitter was doing a good enough job of holding free speech principles. You know, after that, he made a decision to buy 10% of Twitter. And then we woke up this morning to an SEC filing where he has made an offer to purchase all the outstanding shares of Twitter and take it public. That filing is really interesting, both in what he's offering for a share share price. What he thinks they can do for investors and what he's saying that Twitter's doing for free speech. So it's an interesting day all around in terms of social media argument, in terms of where tech companies are going, in terms of Elon Musk. You know, it's really interesting at the peak of his illegal activity, alleged illegal activity, around 70% of what was trending was about Elon Musk and his illegal activity of missing his filing requirement, which netted him about $156 million in profit, okay? And I'm sure you're familiar with that. Now that he has made this bold proclamation that he wants to outright purchase Twitter, now all of the news is trending about his potential purchase of Twitter and not the fact that he committed this financial crime. What are your thoughts about that? Any correlation here? Uh, I mean, all I can say, I'm not an expert in uh, Elon Musk's business dealings, other than to say that um, it's well known that he's had uh, fights with the SEC, mm-hmm. um, even fights about with the SEC about what he's put on Twitter. Um, he's certainly got a lot of yeah. information there, and um, his purchase of Twitter certainly bumped the stock price. Uh, people, you know, the market seems to believe in Elon Musk, uh, but again, he's got a lot of fights going on with the SEC um, a lot of the time. Let me ask you: Do you think it's a good thing or bad thing uh, if? Elon Musk purchases Twitter. I think it's way too early to tell. Uh, I mean, you know, who knows what kind of content moderation decisions he would make. I, I would just say that, um, you know, for some time we spend a lot of time talking about what's going on on Twitter. Uh, but Twitter's been a really stagnant platform for a long period of time. They basically had zero user growth for the last uh, four to five years. Um, they don't really have a great way to monetize uh, Twitter. They don't bring in a lot of revenue, like something like a Google or a Meta. Or an Apple or an Amazon does. Um, you know, the, the biggest innovation Twitter's had in a while is sort of copying Clubhouse and their spaces, uh, which has proved to be fairly popular, but again, really difficult to monetize. So, you know, we'll see it. You know, maybe he'll do a total redesign of Twitter. Maybe this is just about, you know, the speech moderation on Twitter that he's unhappy with. Um, I don't think we know yet. So let me Let me give you my sentiment based on what he's already put on the record. I think that's the fair way to analyze it. Even if you don't like Elon Musk, I don't have a lot of love for the guy personally. But I want to judge this based on the merits of his own conversation, things that he has said on the record. So according to Elon Musk, he is what's called a free speech absolutist. Are you familiar with that terminology? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, now you know what that means, correct? Yeah, he basically wants very few restrictions on speech. He's gone out and said a few things, like he wants to get rid of spam on Twitter, but you know, probably the widest amount of speech possible he wants on the platform. Now, your business, you understand the business correlation between social media and corporate brands. A free speech absolutist would say something like, well, we're not going to ban racist commentary. We're not going to ban the use of the N word. Um, even though children frequent on those platforms. If you create a platform that has what's called open source algorithm and allows for the use of these extremely racist words and derogatory comments, corporate brands have to flee from that space. As a matter of fact, 
The deals that they already create with social media platforms, those deals will say things like do not associate our content with the N word, do not associate our content with this word, this phraseology, that phraseology. And it becomes like five or six pages of what not to connect the brand to. So if you have an Elon Musk sentiment or ideological or, or printable inside of a Twitter, I would say it actually takes more money away from Twitter if you're looking at it from a corporate model. Would you not agree? Uh, you know, again, I think we'll see where Elon Musk, if he is able to um, take over Twitter, starts to draw that line. Absolutely. Um, you know, how you monetize a website like that, uh, you know, has been through traditional advertising. Maybe he has a, an idea to make it more of a creator space where people are paying people directly to tweet. Uh, but it's certainly a, a problem that they've had for a long time when people have made sort of Twitter clones and said, we're not going to moderate speech at all. Most people haven't gone over there because they don't like a lot of the content that they see. And that's certainly a market response to uh, concerns about spam, to racism, to you know whatever else people don't want to see when they open up you know, their app you know, first thing in the morning. Yeah, um, so you do understand that the freedom of speech is not absolute even in the US Constitution or the interpretation of law. You know that. So when somebody says they are free speech absolutist, they are contrary to even what the Constitution and statutory language says in the United States. For example, I can't say whatever I want to say about you without potentially having a libel or a slander suit, right? Because there's a limitation to your speech. I can't yell fire in a crowded building, no fire people get hurt because of the stampede. Uh, these are Supreme Court rulings that clearly said there is no such thing as absolute free speech in America, right? So when you have a person that says, well, they are a free speech absolutist, you don't think that's dangerous and potentially in violation of section 230, uh, which requires companies like this to utilize good faith efforts to monitor the content to make sure abuses are not taking place. Oh, I think we have a different understanding of some of those Supreme Court cases. Uh, you know, I'll talk about the fire in a crowded theater real briefly. You know, that was a case where the Supreme Court said that putting out information uh, opposing the draft in one in World War One was akin to yelling fire in a crowded theater. And so, um, to my mind, that's political speech. And you're talking about Section 230. You know, what we're really talking about is what you got to the the libel laws, which is who's liable for speech on a platform like Twitter. Or you know Facebook, whether it's the person like you or me who is writing that speech or the platform that's hosting that sort of speech. Um, you know when it comes to speech restrictions, obviously um, what the government is allowed to restrict is very um, low in this country, right? We are an outlier when it comes to our commitment to free speech in the First Amendment. Um, it's not shared in most of the world. It, you know, it'll be it'll be interesting to see how somebody like Elon Musk tries to draw that line. Uh, because it isn't in, in a lot of different countries. The second largest user of Twitter is in Japan, uh, but it has, doesn't have the global reach that a lot of these other large social media platforms, like you know TikTok, for example, do. Well, let's go back to 230 um, Communication Decency Act. In order for 230 to apply, which basically creates a liability, uh, a liability immunity to the platform, the platform has to engage in good faith efforts to monitor the content to make sure the content is not harassing, the content is not abusive, the content does not allow for the spread of um, libelous information against someone. And if you then introduce an individual who controls one of, one of these media platforms and his ideology is free speech absolutist ideology, then he no longer, that platform no longer has the protection of section 230 based on the actual language of 230. Uh, so that's not my understanding of Section 230. Okay. Uh, the way What's I your understanding of it? Yeah, what uh, Section 230 says, again, we're talking about slander or libel. So I think this is a really good example, right? Mm -hmm. If I go on, on Twitter and I libel you um, saying something that I know to not be true to in order to defame your character, um, what that's saying is that Twitter is not held responsible for me putting up that speech. You're welcome to bring a libel suit against me, Eric. Peterson. No, 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 sir. That's not correct. You skipped a point. Uh, you can always sue a person naturally right. for right. libel, right? You can always sue them for slander. Right. 230 says, but you can't sue the social media outfit. That's correct. If, if they are engaging in good faith practices to actually monitor the content. They don't have to get it perfect, but they do have to possess a protocol. 
And if they do not possess a protocol by systemic design, it doesn't mean they won't make mistakes. But if they do not possess a protocol by systemic design, that then takes away the good faith requirement to monitor the content, which then creates an allowance for lawsuits to come after the platform. Is your understanding of 230 clear now? No, it's different because I agree that if they engage in moderation that they're also not held liable for that speech. But also if they don't have moderation standards like some of the other social media networks that aren't very popular because they don't engage in any sort of moderation whatsoever. They also can't be held liable for things like slander. No, that's not true. If your platform shows a reckless disregard for monitoring abusive content, and individuals are able to spew that content, Section 230 does not apply to you. Section 230 was never meant to protect people, it was meant to protect big companies. Mm -hmm. But yeah. big companies have an obligation to try to protect people. That's the way 230 works. You didn't know that? Uh, when we have a different uh, understanding of that law when it was written at the- Oh, part come of on, the brother, we, we, can, we can debate opinion, we can't debate facts. When was the last time you read 230? Uh, two weeks ago. Okay, brother, it hasn't changed since two weeks. <laughs> okay. All right, all right, we'll, we'll we will on. agree to disagree on that, brother. But I, mm -hmm. I would encourage you to to read 230 mm -hmm. and the interpretation um, of 230 and the Communication Decency Act. I do appreciate you being on the program. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely.